things of Jesus. And so in a moment, you will hear the word of forgiveness from Sister Sharika, Sister Sharika Emerson. Amen. They're clapping for you. You're going to hear the word of salvation by Sister April Alexis. She's coming from the back to the front. <laughs> the word of relationship from Deacon Aaron Brawley. The word of abandonment from Deacon Ernestine Long. The word of distress from Deacon Faith Wright Johnson. Word of triumph from Brother Nick Jefferson. And word of reunion for Elden Training Marcus Dickerson. I encourage you to listen and take notes. I believe God's going to bless you and give you something to reflect on this evening. Amen? Amen. Amen. Come on. Let's welcome Sister Rika. Much obliged to my family and friends. It's an honor to stand in your presence to speak a word of forgiveness. In the book of Luke 23, 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Imagine yourself in the book of Luke. You are well known. You have saved lives, performed miracles after miracles, delivered, healed, faithful believers. You're taking a stroll, minding your own Christian business, and you hear the chief priests and the teachers of the law looking for a way to get rid of Jesus. But you're not the only one who hears. Jesus' so-called friend, Judas, as is amongst the crowd. How many can relate to a time that you have been hurt or gone over and beyond or lost something or someone for a family member, a friend, a sibling, an ex, an employer, or even a church? I'm sure you can agree with me that revenge was your first thought. But why is that the first thing that we think of when hurt arises? It's the human divine nature as you read through the scripture again, think about this time tonight. Think about it. Scripture states that Judas took money and found the right opportunity to lead them to Jesus when a crowd was not around. Two enemies, Polite and Herod, rulers and a governor. One knew the polite way was to find no wrongdoing because, he was, because of his Roman belief. The other one had no heart heard about a man and wanted to see a sign, but in which he mocked Jesus, dressed him in an elegant robe, sent him back to the land in which he was going to die and killed John the Baptist. But with Jesus in the mix, they realized each authority, but yet still afraid to kill Jesus on their own account. It was the people who decided the fate of Jesus. These people choose evil over greatness, witness things unseen and unheard, but still wanted someone that brought violence in the city and was a murderer. Again, how can people do someone that is so genuine, pure, forgiving, and means well, what to, want to cause so much harm as this? Prayed with them, and he also prepared with them. The first utters from our Savior as he was brutally being executed, a personal plea to the Father, not for himself, safety, or well-being, but for the people who were murdering him. Even before the highest priest forever, he even now was acting as an intercessor for his tormentors. Jesus is also saying they just don't know out of the act of ignorance. Sin against God has levels of knowledge and lack of it. There's, that's why it's important to participate in Bible in one year, having weekly sessions in Bible study with your small group, knowing the word. But we as humans, we get tired. But think about Jesus physically had no strength. 
His divine nature was human nature. He was utterly impotent to save himself. He had no strength to do it, but he was still perfectly united to his divine nature. And that divine nature to his DNA was omnipotent. There are two words that have the same letter, but one, could and would. The reason why not the reason why Jesus could not save himself is not because he didn't do it. He didn't save himself because he wouldn't do it. And that is because of the covenant of redemption. God is a covenant keeper. We should want to be more like Jesus and love on those that intend harm on us. But give the love and the compassion Jesus displayed on the cross. Forgiveness from the heart. Sometimes God will give us signs to prepare for a heartbreak, betrayal, disappointment, death, loss of a job. It's going to happen. But remember these things. Have faith in God. Be obedient. Repent your sins. Ask for, ask for grace. Know your identity. Walk in victory. Evangelize to those that don't know. Ask for new life. Reach for eternity. Ask God for strength and seek salvation. Those, those come out to be what? Forgiveness. When you bind yourself in the covenant of Jesus Christ, it is now a part of your DNA. We must forgive those who hurt us as Jesus did. He forgives us. Why can't we forgive? Which DNA do you want to be known for? Jesus loves you, and so do I. Uh, because I see the timer going and I ain't start yet. I'm gonna ask you to put that back on seven minutes. <laughs> that was a clap for her. I have not started. <laughs> Thank you. She ain't done it yet. I'm for real. I want my going back to seven. <laughs> All right, Luke 23, <laughs> 43. Today you will be with me. In paradise. So as I studied this scripture and um, looked at it itself and then what led up to it, God revealed to me the posture or the mental posture of Jesus and of one of the criminals that was with him on the cross. And so they both produced actions and words that were really just not natural for the situation that they were in. And so you wonder, well, how could they have done these things during this time? And it's because of what they were focused on. So when we look at Luke 23, it really paints a picture of violence and darkness. There's lots of mocking. There's insults. Jesus has nails in his hands and in his feet. He has thorns in his head. And um, yet, this is all after he's been beaten, mocked, and flogged. And so you can see, like, how can there be any light that comes from a situation that is like this? It's because of what they were focused on. And so that's the question for tonight. Where is your focus? So on one side of Jesus, he has a criminal who's hurling insults at him. Now one, it's like, you are being crucified. Who has time to be insulting somebody and you dying? Like, is that really what your focus is gonna be? And so when we look at that, we can see that he is not focused on the one that can save his life. That's what he should have been focused on. And so we're trying to see that his focus is only what's in front of him. He just has his earthly eyes, but what he needs to be focused on is what's in heaven. So he has missed a huge opportunity here because he is focused on the wrong thing. On the other side of Jesus, we have a criminal who is focused on the right thing. He's focused on Christ. He hears the other guy and he says, don't you fear God since you're under the same sentence? We are punished justly for we are getting what we deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. See, this criminal understands who Jesus is and he acknowledges that openly. So you know when you are in a room full of people and there's a bunch of noise, sometimes that noise is of people complaining, is of people cursing, but I know it's not you. 
We have people that are, you know, speaking real loud, trying to tell you to be politically correct about something that you're not supposed to be po politically correct about. And then just all this talking that's going on, but then it says, well, where is your focus in that situation? How do you respond to it? What do your words and your actions say? Do they say that your mind and your heart are heavenly bound? Is that how we respond? Where is your focus? So we can see that this criminal here, he's keeping his focus on heaven and on Christ. And then he takes an opportunity of a lifetime and he says to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And then Jesus replies with this, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, if you notice what the criminal says and what Jesus says, there is a difference. The criminal says, I want you to remember me in your kingdom. But Jesus says, oh no, you will be with me in paradise. See, the definition of paradise is a place or condition of great happiness where everything is exactly as you would want it to be. Now, don't you want to hear those words when you're on your deathbed? Doesn't that bring you comfort? So because this criminal was focused on Christ, he gets two things. One, he gets assurance of eternal life. And in the moment, not after death, but in the moment, he gets his own peace, he gets love, and he gets comfort. All because he's focused on Jesus. That's where his attention is. So we want to make sure that our focus is on Jesus. Is your focus on the paradise that God has created for you? And he wants to welcome you to it. So in verse 43, today you will be with me in paradise. Um, let's kind of break that down. It says, I assure you, is how that verse uh, begins. And so that means that it's for certain. It's a fact. It's going to happen. We can always rest in Jesus's assurance. Y'all know the song, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. He assures the salvation of the criminal, and he still does that for us today. That's the next word that Jesus says is today. That means that it's in this moment, in this time, at this second, with this action that guarantees our salvation. It's because Jesus specifically was crucified. He died. He gave up his life. He went down to hell. He defeated all of death and everything else down there. It's because of that specific action that we have salvation, and we cannot skip over that. Lastly, Jesus says, you will be with me in paradise. Now, this was a personalized message, because if y'all remember, it's like a, a lot of other stuff going on, <laughs> like people dying, you know, in this situation. It's people yelling at the bottom. And so for them to have this kind of like one-on-one -on -one conversation right now didn't have to happen. So Jesus, again, having his focus on heaven, he gives this man his attention because he knows that it's his mission from God to make sure that we can have our salvation. And so because he gives this attention to this man, this man gets peace. And so um, we're able to know that you can extend love within that moment, and that's what that man gets. Only because Jesus knows what his focus is supposed to be on, and this man put his focus on Christ. So I ask you again, where is your focus? Out of everything that Jesus went through, the beating, the false accusations, the insults, the pain, the agony, he kept his focus on God's plan. He kept his focus on fulfilling his purpose in order to make sure that you and me were able to gain salvation. This is the word of salvation, and it assures us as Christians to know that we have access to paradise with him. If you don't know Christ, take this opportunity. Be like that criminal. Speak up and take your opportunity of a lifetime and let Jesus know that you believe in him, in his crucifixion, and his raising up from the dead. That is just for you. So this is me keeping the focus on heaven. And when things get ugly, when things get bad, even when things are good, keep your focus on God, keep your focus on heaven, and see the glimpse of paradise that God has prepared just for you. Amen, amen. Man, it's, it's tough to follow those two acts, so I'm going to do my best, but don't hold it against me. Um, today I've been honored to speak about the word of relationship, and my intent today is that you guys will walk away knowing the transcendent love, um, evident in Jesus' character, and his commitment to meeting needs 
even when it's not convenient for him. All right, and I wanted to also tell you guys how we can apply that into our own lives. So we're going to go to the scripture in John 19, 26, and it says, When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. Verse 27 continues and says, From that time on, the disciple took her into his home. Now I'm going to paint a picture for you guys that you've already seen before, okay? We already know. What we're celebrating today is Good Friday. We know that Jesus is hanging up on the cross when he's saying these words. But I'm just going to dive in a little bit deeper here so we can feel that pain, okay? So then in the last 24 hours, Jesus has been betrayed by his closest friends. He's been denied three times by his friend who said he would never betray him. Um, and the rest of, his, uh, the rest of his, his, his friends have scattered to the wind. Along with that, we read in the, um, in the scriptures that he has been blindfolded beaten, mocked, scorned, um, punched several times, slapped, spit on, flogged, and forced to carry the instrument that would lead to his death. So clearly Jesus is not having the best day. <laughs> right. Um, literally, the, the fate of the universe is weighing on his shoulders in, right now in this moment. And yet we find him looking up from his own agony to see Mary. I have a few questions when I read this text. I'm, I'm wondering, okay, well, why does he give responsibility of John to his mother? I'm sorry, John, responsibility of his mother to John. Why not Joseph? Why not his brothers? Um, and then my other question is, why is this important to do right now? Clearly, he has a lot more on his mind. But there's an urgency with which Jesus says that this is his last, one of the last words that he ever says um, before he resurrects. And so, you know, to get, to get the answers to that, to get the clarity we need, I think we have to see another picture. One that gets lost in the cosmic, you know, um, importance of this moment, and that's of Mary. You see, I believe that Jesus looked up from his own agony and he had compassion when he saw his mother Mary. Mary, just like any other mother would do, she's not focused on her own needs in that moment. She is focusing on her son and his suffering. I mean, y'all I mean, know what it's like to be riding a tricycle as a kid and fall down and scrape your knee. And who comes saving you but mom? So, I mean, y'all know. So, just imagine that the, the magnitude to which she is feeling Heartbreak. I'm sure she's probably surprised that her heart hasn't stopped beating at this moment. She's watching her son massacred before her eyes. And Jesus looks at her and he says, no, that's not how your story ends. I'm not going to leave you in this moment. Jesus, in his agony, sees her need. You know, um, you know, theologians tell us that, uh, that Joseph likely passed away um, before this moment. And so Mary was a widow. And Levitical law says that the firstborn son is supposed to take care of the, uh, of the I'm trying it. Hey, look. <laughs> uh, take care of the mother. Man, I got limited time. Uh, <laughs> it's supposed to take, care, take the responsibility of, uh, of the mother on. And so um, Jesus is looking ahead. She can't even see the need, but he says, no, I see the future need that you're going to have, and I'm not going to have it. You know, I don't care. Jesus' is, Jesus's commitment to love didn't stop when he was put on the cross. He still had breath in his lungs. And so um, Jesus, Jesus makes sure that, um, you know, he, he's, he's taking care of that need before she even sees it. And, uh, you know, a lot of people say, you know, I don't believe in God because he, he didn't meet my need. He didn't, when I was hurting, he didn't answer my prayer. I, I believe our friend Kanye West has something to say about that a few weeks ago. But this text says something to the contrary. It shows us that Jesus is committed to going out of his way, even when it's uncomfortable for him to meet our needs. Especially if you have a relationship with Jesus, there's nothing he won't do to meet that need. So, so the point is... <laughs> Jesus is never too preoccupied to meet a need, all right? If it hurts you, it matters to him. So what are we supposed to do with all this? Um, well, I want to go back to uh, verse 27. It says, from that time on, the disciple took her into his home. 
And uh, I find it interesting that Jesus' solution to Mary's need was a person. I think that says something right there. And uh, it wasn't one of his unbelieving brothers either who didn't even bother to show up at his crucifixion. It was the person who did show up and who proved that he could love Mary, Jesus' mother like Jesus would. And so, yes, it was John. So, um, <laughs> and so I think the question is, now that we've read this verse and we know what Jesus would do, what are we going to do about it? He's called us to be his followers. How can we say that we're his followers if we're not loving people the way he would? You know, I think it's easy to get caught up in our own self-absorption. Things happen to us on a daily basis. I get that. But none of us is hanging on a cross. So when you, when you are tempted to, to wallow in those things, which admittedly we have reasons to grieve about, I'm wondering, will you choose to comfort someone else? Will you choose to be the solution to a need? And that's my ask of you today. When you're tempted, remember what Jesus did. He was never too preoccupied to meet a need. Be that person. Be that solution. Thank you. Praise God, everybody. Um, I'm going to read John 12, 27, um, where it says, but for the purpose, Jesus said, for this purpose, I've come to this hour. Before Jesus' crucifixion, Jesus was tried by an unjust judicial system. False witnesses came against him. They spat upon him. He had a crown of thorns put on his head. He was flogged, abandoned, abandoned by the disciples. They just left him. He was nailed, his feet and his hands to the cross. And then on the ninth hour, darkness filled the land. And in agony and pain, Jesus cried out. This is in Matthew 27:46. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why had thou forsaken me? The cry wasn't of defeat. God was turning away from his beloved son, who was our sin bearer. Jesus was the only way he could be, uh, that we could be reconciled to God. He bore our sins upon his, on the cross so we could receive salvation and eternal life. He had taken on human form as a man who knew no sin. And he took his sins, our sins, upon himself. He took everybody's sin. Believe it. He took everybody. Okay? He took everybody. But God was holy and hated sin and would not allow sin in his presence. Now, Hebrew, Hebrew 13, 5, God says, I will never leave you. He said he would never forsake him. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm on the wrong one right now. That's not it. <laughs> and uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become righteousness of God in him. Yes. He endured the penalty that we deserved. In the darkness hour, in that darkness hour, Jesus felt alone, pain, and he was suffering. I have a question, I have a question, I've questioned God time, at times, and I'm quite sure all of us have. I felt lonely, troubled, lost, Lost, loved ones were lost, rejected, nothing's going right, life out of control, rejection. Some of us have been lied on too, okay? And I could go on and on and on. Why? And then, it, you know, you get to a place where it says, I am suffering, where well, you have suffered so long, especially some of us saints. I suffered so long with sickness. 
and we're praying, calling upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's taken so long, and we're wondering why. Where are you, Lord God? What's going on here? And then we feel that rejection. Okay. But God has it where in Psalms 22, there's a messianic song. Okay. And it's a prophecy written by David. An old prophecy that's been, be, been fulfilled by Jesus in the New Testament. Yes. And then Psalms 22, this prophecy is a victory that's fulfilled in Jesus and the New Testament. Um, in the Old Testament, where it had, where in 22, Psalms 22, if you read it, it will tell you what was happening at the time in Matthew 27, 46. God had already prepared. This was always, this was for the word to be fulfilled. So we could have eternal life. And that our sins would be forgiven. And it only could be forgiven by the Lord Jesus Christ. Where we could be reconciled unto God. In Hebrews 13, 5, God says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. In Psalms 22, 30, this is for us. That happened in the Old Testament because this is from Psalms 22. A generation shall serve him. It will be recounted of the Lord to the next generation. They will come and decide his righteousness to a people who will be born that he has done this. So we will be the examples for the next generation as they come, all right? You know that we are not alone. God is with us at all times, even till the end of time. God is alive, he's omnipresent, he's concerned about every aspect of our lives, spiritually, physically, emotionally, and financially. And he has everything under control. And he says he will care for you. You will have everlasting life. He will meet every need. So we praise God that he's given us that power and the uh, way to do what we need to do because we have to speak word because the word is power. And the power, and Jesus said, you know, even with the word, his word shall not return void, but accomplish and establish where he sends it. So if you send that word, it will accomplish what you are looking for and asking for in life. And know, always know that Jesus sacrificed his sins for us.
I said yes. Those who know me know I do not do public speaking, but I said yes. <laughs> Word of distress, John 19, 28. Jesus knew that his mission was finished and he fulfilled the scripture and said, I thirst. Let's find a definition for mission, an important assignment to carry out. So Jesus had a mission a mission of assignment which he needed to be completed. Okay, let's go back to um, John 19, 6 to 10, where it says here, the religious leaders and soldiers saw him. They spoke with loud voices, nail him to the cross, nail him to the cross. Pilate said, take him yourself and nail him to the cross. As for me, I do not find him guilty. The Jews said to Pilate, we have a law that says he should die because he said he is a son of God. When Pilate heard them say this, he was more afraid. He went into the courtroom again. He said to Jesus, why, where do you come from? Jesus did not say a word. Pilate said, will you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the right and the power to nail you to the cross? I have the right and the power to let you go free. Pilate had no right. <laughs> Who do you think he is? No, he didn't have no right. God has the right. He has the only power. He sent his son for a mission. Now, Jesus refused to answer Pilate because he knew his mission was not finished. The assignment which God gave him was not finished. So he had to be crucified for it to be finished. So Pilate couldn't save him. Now, think about it. Pilate says, okay, I can save you, but you have to tell me everything. No. So Jesus said, Jesus refused to answer him, but he went on to be crucified. Think about it, he had to carry this heavy cross. Sometimes I even carry a backpack and I get tired, okay? <laughs> it's a hot sun. This cross is ridiculous. He's sweating. People are torturing him. They whipped him. And then the cross that he had to carry, they nailed him. They put him on the cross. He was in distress. A few weeks ago, no, exactly less than a week ago, they were cheering, Messiah, <laughs> Messiah. Now they want to crucify me. They want to kill me. He was in distress. But guess what? He still had mission an assignment to complete. His assignment was not over as yet. When they, sorry, because he knew his mission was not fulfilled, he bare the pain of humiliation. He bare the pain of them torturing him. He bare the pain of them looking down on him and saying, Look at him, he's nothing. He's nothing, but yet a week ago he used all everything to you. Right? I'm like, how can you really? Think of your friends. Seriously, think of your friends. One minute you're best friends with somebody, and they might say something to you, and then you're, I'm not talking to you. <laughs> this is life, I'm not talking to you. But guess what? He had to bear that pain for our sin. He had to go through all of this so that we could live. He had to because he realized the stealing, the fighting, the lying that we all go through had to be forgiven because of what he's going through. And through this all, people are still not satisfied. They're never satisfied. 
They are quarreling, arguing, still not realizing what God did for us. He gave his only son, as John 3.16 said, for God so loved the world, he gave his only, his one and only child to die on that cross for our sins. The sins that, to this day, we're still committing. <laughs> Seriously, think about adultery. Huh? Think about theft. But we're still committing them. And every day he forgive us. Every day he forgive us. And after it all, he realized, guess what? I've fulfilled my assignment. My mission is finished. And I'm saying, I thirst. Good evening, everyone. Um, my topic is Word of Triumph. It is finished. I'll start with a question. Have you ever hit the proverbial brick wall when you're exercising? It can be a very intense experience as you wrestle with pushing through to finish your exercise goal or quitting and coming back to give it a try another day. As difficult as that brick wall may seem, there's that glory on the other side. When you persevere and you push your body to the limit and you get that sense of fulfillment that I finished. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus fulfilled a much greater mission than an exercise goal. In John, John, John 19, chapter 30, tells us, when Jesus, therefore, received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head, and he gave up the ghost. These three simple words, it is finished, are filled with rich and powerful meaning beyond the written text. You see, by saying it is finished, Jesus was in essence saying three things that we can apply to our lives today. The first is that all of God's plans and promises will come to pass. Beginning with the Savior, whose sacrificial death on the cross would serve and pay the price for our sins. It would atone for the sins of mankind. It is finished was Jesus' declaration that all the prophecies concerning me up to this moment have been fulfilled. We can reference scriptures like Daniel 9.26, which speaks of the Messiah who would be cut off from his people after fulfilling his assignment. Scriptures like Zechariah chapter 11, 10, verses 10 and 11, which spoke of a shepherd whose staff or spirit would be broken, thereby revealing the word of the Lord to the poor, opening up the gospel to the poor. It is finished, reminds us that what God says concerning our lives, concerning our savior as well, what he says for our lives shall come to pass. If we will do what Jesus did and persevere. These powerful words also speak of the culmination or the end of Jesus' earthly suffering. This brings to mind the words of the psalm, psalmist in verse chapter 16, Psalm 16, verse 10. For you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. Yes, Jesus would suffer, but only for a while. Long enough to fulfill his mission of shedding his blood for the remission of sins. This is a powerful reminder to us 
during our times of suffering, to someone who's dealing with hardship right now, someone who may be in experiencing persecution right now, it's a reminder to us that God will not abandon us. You may be carrying a heavy cross at this moment, but know that God has stamped your pain with an end date. The, the psalmist said, said it well, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Last, it is finished, was Jesus announcing to the devil a word of ultimate triumph. The victory over death. You see, the soldiers who tormented him and took him down from the cross, they were not the ones who announced that it was finished. Jesus himself declared his transition from mortality to immortality. The application for us as God's people is that through Christ, we are victorious. First Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 57 tells us, but thanks be to God, which gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus demonstrated that God had the ultimate say and he had the victory over death, hell and the grave. So John chapter 19, verse 29 and short is our reminder. It is our word of triumph that man will not get the final say with what we're dealing with. Right. I'm tired of that job or you may be saying I'm ready to give up. But we have to remember God has the final say. Right. So it reminds us that the victory belongs to the Lord. It is finished is our word of triumph. Good evening. So we're going to pray for some grace right now with the time. Come on with the grace. <laughs> so. As we dive into the seventh saying of Jesus' last words on the cross, I got to be honest, I wrestled with this one. And I wrestled with it because, as Brother Nick just said, it is finished. Why are we talking about something else? <laughs> I mean, questions of why really did arise when reading this scripture. Um, well, why is there a need for a seventh saying? The, the, the six previous ones kind of took care of it. It summed it all up. Uh, why, after it is finished, was there anything else that was needed to be said? We just spoke of triumph. Why was there something needed? Why do we need to do anything or say anything more? And if it is so important to say something else, to model something else, why is it so important? So, as we read the scripture, we will attempt to figure out the why behind it all. So this passage is found in Luke chapter 23, verses 44 through 46, and the New King James Version reads as follows. Now it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness all over the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was torn in two. Somebody say, my God. When Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. So I want to talk to you briefly about resting in his hands. So verse 46, getting to the last verse, we specifically see the word commit, commit, which, you know, I may not be the smartest person, but I can go to a dictionary every once in a while, and it means to entrust to, to, to trust in, or to place officially in the custody of. 
So when you think of putting your whole trust into something, when you think of committing to something, when you think of resting in something, you don't worry about it. It's not on your mind. When you think of committing to something, there is a peace that just overtakes you. I mean, even right now, you guys are committed to sitting in your seats. <laughs> you, you have literally entrusted your weight to these, these pews. And not one of you, before I said anything, was thinking about the chairs as you were sitting in it. You were resting in it. So, when we have a personal resting in the Father's hands, this is what was necessary. This was the why behind the important. So, Jesus makes a point to talk about this last. You know, it is said that the final words of a person's life are the most important. That all the fluff and everything else is, is cut away. Um, and what is most important, what is so necessary to be said is what comes out. And we find here at the end of Jesus hanging on the cross for him to say, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. So there is a personal entrustment at the end of it all. And the question is, why? Why are we down to the, the personal entrustment? And I've come here to tell you that the why behind it all was you. You see, I don't have the time to tell you, but in verse 45, when he talks about the tearing of the veil, there was a separation between the high priest and the most holy place in the temple that now was torn so we could have a personal relationship with God. I don't have all the time to tell you that all the works that Jesus did. He cast out demons. He, he healed the sick. He was on a mission as we heard today. But at the end of the day, the mission was not as important as you. You were the mission at the end of it all. It wasn't just about casting out demons. It wasn't just about preaching the gospel, which is great, but it is about you and your souls saving you. So the assignment may be important, but God is looking at the assignee. So the work may be significant, but God cares about the worker's heart. For my church folks in here, we talk about service. Your service may be great, but God is caring about your servant's heart. So at the end of it all, Jesus modeled this for us. What was important to Jesus for us to see 2,000 years later is that at the end of it all, he wanted to rest in the Father's hand, have a personal relationship with the Father. Victory over sin is sweet. Why? Because it allows you and you and you to rest in the Father's hand. Triumph over the grave is great. Why? Because it allows you to have the opportunity to rest in the Father's hand. I need you to know that there is no greater victory or triumph in Jesus' eyes than to save a wretch like me, than to save you, than to save you, than to save you. If it was just one, he would have saved you to save your soul. You pushing me. I can't. I don't get the time. You pushing me over there. <laughs> so at the close of it all, Jesus came not just to overcome the world, but he did. Not just to beat sin, but he did. Not just to defeat the grave, but he did. Jesus' mission was to save the lost, the disconnected, the hurting world, to save their souls. As I told you in the beginning, there is a why. There's a why behind it all. And the why at the end of it all was about a personal relationship with the Father. The why at the end of it all was about you so that you too can personally rest in his hands. Thank you.